Good afternoon. I'm Erin Faso, and this is my daughter Stephanie, and we're going to be presenting today from nonverbal to master's degree, the impact of my journey being her journey. But uh, we have spoken here a few years in a row, and we really enjoy it. So, and I'm sorry I'm having to sit, but I had bilateral knee replacements a month ago. So, uh, so this is an overview of our presentation. I'll introduce myself and Stephanie, give you a little bit of background. And then I'm going to give you a little overview on inclusion and my perspectives as a mom and as a teacher. And then I'll tell you a little more about Stephanie and give you a little bit of background about her life. And then we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about inclusion, Stephanie's inclusion history, her education, and how she ended up where she is now. And then Stephanie will share her perception and um, what she's up to now on inclusion and integration. And then we'll open it up for questions. Oops, uh oh. What did I just do? Sorry. Let me just use this. So, my name is Erin, and I am a teacher at Kimberlian School District, or I was for 29 years. I had to resign so that because we had trouble finding nursing for Stephanie, and then my mom became ill, so I'm caring for the two of them. Uh, I grew up in San Jose, always went to public schools. And my dad was on the school board, so our family was very involved with the educational system. And I went to San Jose State, got my bachelor's degree at San Jose State, and then I also um, got my teaching credential there. Is there a way to make this full screen up there? Sorry. So, when I was 14, I was di diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder that, uh, there we go, a connective tissue disorder, and it affects my joints, um, and I have chronically dislocating joints, hence having a bilateral knee replacement a month ago. And uh, it affects our skin and other internal organs. So Stephanie and my other daughter both have the syndrome also that they inherited from me. So I was put in adaptive PE in high school um, because my, I'm very limited on my physical activity. So I was a teacher for various grade levels in Cambrian School District from kindergarten through eighth grade. And I taught general education. My background is more special education. But then when I had Stephanie, I decided to stick with the general education. And then I also taught extended school year for the special education department for our district. Uh, I have two daughters, Stephanie and Summer. Stephanie's the older of the two. And her sister, Summer, is uh, a teacher for special education. She's earning her moderate to severe cr teaching credential right now. And she also has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, ADHD, and learning disabilities. So she's was in the special education system herself. And then Stephanie is, um, we'll talk about some more. Her main diagnosis is cerebral palsy. And she is, um, I, I wanted her to include it as much as possible throughout life because I knew that she would have to be in society and com the community. And so she would have to be able to know how to uh, get around and be able to function in society. Little did I know. So Stephanie had a traumatic birth, which caused brain damage. She was eight pounds, five ounces, two weeks, two weeks late. Uh, and she, her heart gave out during the labor. So she was without a heartbeat for 24 minutes, without oxygen um, for even longer. And so sh it caused the brain damage. And I knew that with her, uh, with what happened with her, that we had one miracle happening that she was born and living, and so I wouldn't expect another miracle for her to go out of that un unscaped. So she also has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. She began early intervention at three months old, and we're gonna talk some more about all these, and she was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at 22 months, and she, which she also has a lot of other health-related problems, such as epilepsy, digestive issues, heart and lung damage from her birth. So, uh, I want to go over a little bit about an overview with, of children with disabilities. disabilities. Disability is the largest minority group worldwide. 
and it is one of the only, if not the only, minority group that all of us may possibly belong to at some point in our lives, whether it's temporary or permanent. And approximately 10% of children between 3 and 13 years of age receive special education services in the school system. So most of us will end up having um, children who are integrated, mainstreamed, whatever, within society and in, in the classroom. And having a disability can be a greater obstacle, actually, it's been proven th than in the education system than being uh, poor and in poverty. Um, and children with disabilities, specifically Latino, Latina, and other ethnic minorities, are among the most marginalized populations in the school system. So a lot of teachers ask, why inclusion? Well, first of all, it's the law. We all know the idea states that children will receive special education services and learn, but learn in the least restrictive environment. But a lesser known is the Article 24 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which says state parties recognize the rights for persons with disabilities to education. State parties shall ensure an inclusive education system at all levels and ensure that persons with disabilities are not excluded from the general education system on the basis of their disability and that children with disabilities are not excluded from the free and the compulsory education on the basis of their disability. So some more statistics and information that's been proven in the research is inclusion sh should be tailored for each child but the needs of the child can change over time. So it may need to increase time, decrease time, different settings. And according to Inclusion Works, which is put out by the California Department of Education, the biggest barrier to including a child with disabilities or other special needs seems to be fear, not of the child with special needs, but for the children. They're afraid that they might accidentally hurt them, they might not know what to do, uh, how to meet their needs and the perception of the parents, the other students in the classroom. And the impact of inclusion, uh, I like this quote, when inclus inclusive education is fully embraced, we abandon the idea that children have to become normal in order to contribute to the world. Instead, we search for and nourish the gifts that are inherent in all people. We begin to look beyond the typical ways of becoming valued members of the community and in doing so, begin to realize an achievable goals of providing all children with an authentic sense of belonging. And I think that everybody has the human need to belong and desire to be a part of a group. So the impact of inclusion, students with disabilities do better in a setting where more is expected of them. And that's, of course, the Pygmalion in the classroom experiments, uh, where the teacher expects more from the students. The students will rise to that, and their achievement will go up. And the op opposite is also true. Uh, so if we have high expectations from the teacher, it's, it allows the students to import, learn important academic and social skills. I always had very high expectations for Stephanie. I wasn't sure what to expect, but I did have high expectations and expect the school system to do the same. So the impact of inclusion, uh, children with disabilities, brains develop stronger neural, neural connections in richer learning environment. All children develop a positive understanding of themselves and others, and it has been shown that having an inclusive classroom shows, uh, helps the students with commonalities, appreciate, appreciate diversity, show team leadership skills, and friendship for, friendships form. And students with differing abilities add diversity and strengths to the general education classroom. It reduces the stigma of the disability. It prepares the child or all the children for the diversity of the real world and helps children to learn to navigate their peers, interactions in society and in the community. So I have a lot of teachers ask, so what does inclusive inclusion mean? So in order to have inclusion, you have to look at it in different ways. Yeah, there's pull-in inclusion, push-out inclusion, where it's in the classroom, out of the classroom. Uh, specific classrooms could be designated as an inclusive classroom or all of the classrooms, and then they rotate. But it should be school-wide, and it should be on the playground, at lunchtime, in the cafeteria, uh, at assemblies. 
and it, it should be throughout the school. They could have a buddy system where they're buddied up with a different class, or they could have a buddy system where specific students are buddied with the students who are being included. And special education teacher and or the support staff need to or can help the general education students in small groups if that child is in that group. Um, and also, something I want to add is that it's very important for the general education teachers and the aides to have the training to be able to know what to do and how to do it, you know, for the included students. Students should be, I mean, I'm sorry, the professionals should be flexible, fluid, and based on each child's individual needs for the inclusion. And what works for one child may not work for another, even if they have the same diagnosis or have similarities. But also, a lot of schools that I've come in contact with, they say, well, this is how we do inclusion, so we need to have the students fit the inclusion model that we have, rather than this is what the student needs, so let's have the school figure out how to make that work for that ch child. So I have some tips for regular uh, general education teachers. The inclusion is just good teaching. You must see all students as an asset and not a burden. And we're going to talk a bit, little bit about um, Stephanie's experiences of both. Uh, we're going to, and then you can identify the strengths of the child so that they can be, uh, you can draw on those in the classroom. And there's a book, Neurodiversity in the Classroom by Thomas Armstrong, and it has a 165 item checklist that you can go down for any child and see what their abilities and positive attributes are so that they can be assessed for the classroom. And universal design for learning and differentiated instruction benefits all students. And when I was a teacher, I would just have the, the students who are included write in on that, and, um, and it worked really well. So it's just good teaching. You need to, as a teacher, be flexible with teaching and learning strategies. Keep an eye and ear open for, to handle any problems that might come up. If a child's getting frustrated, just like the rest of the students, you want to go over and take care of that before it gets to be a problem. If you see kids who are whispering or maybe snickering, you might want to address that um, and make sure that it's taken care of before it gets to be a bigger problem. And then don't he hesitate to ask for needed training, information, help, support. Uh, that's really important. and so. You, if you work as a team, then everybody will be helping each other out. And you, know, you aren't expected to know everything there is to know about inclusion. We've had some really good experiences with inclusion where the, she's the first person in a school, in a club, in a, in a program, out in the community and to be included. And it worked out beautifully um, just because everybody problem solved and worked together. So working as a team, parents, teachers, other professionals, and the child need to work together to support the success of the child. Again, it's a child first, and it, the child sh should have an input, if possible, on their inclusive experiences and what they would like to do. do. Uh, and I've always let Stephanie choose her activities throughout her childhood, and we just figured out a way. I t always told her, We'll figure out a way for you to be able to do whatever it is. You know, you can do anything that other kids are doing. Just got to figure out a different way. Um, she started writing her own, uh, own IEP goals at six years old and trying to have an input on everything. <laughs> so <laughs> she'll talk a little bit more about herself. Uh, and you want to have it with a child's success in mind and not what the comfort level is of you, but what the child is needing. You need to be flexible, and you may have to change things that, as it goes, but that's how teaching is, at least. Uh, communication, talking to each other, and building on making sure everybody's on the same page, especially if there's a behavioral plan or some type of uh, emergency protocol or anything, just making sure that everybody knows what's going on. And having a positive attitude, which really, really changes uh, and works for the benefit of everybody. Uh, I didn't have time to do a presentation on inclusion for ch early childhood or Stephanie's experiences in her early childhood and daycare, but um, this is a really good resource. It's called Inclusion Works, Creating Child Care for Programs to Promote Belonging for Children with Special Needs, and it's put on by the Department of Education, and it's a good resource even if, as a teacher or other community leaders that you can 
look up some ideas, not just for daycare. So as I said, Stephanie has severe athetoid cerebral palsy. The athetoid means she has extra movements, she has trouble sitting up, um, which was caused by the brain damage at birth, and she has a lot of health problems to go along with it, and she was given a very grim prognosis at the beginning of her life. She, uh, she was baptized right off by the pediatrician that was attending, and I was brought a picture of what she was gonna look like, what she looked like, and I was told, I probably wouldn't be able to see her. Um, she wasn't gonna make it long enough because they were resuscitating her. Um, she was diagnosed at 22 months old. We didn't know what her prognosis was with the diagnosis. She was non-responsive, not able to uh, make eye contact, open her eyes for the first year, no verbalizations, no movements. So she was almost almost in like a vegetative state for the first year where she just was kind of a blob. And so when she, uh, we didn't know what her cognitive capabilities were either. And so we just kind of went with it and baby steps, you know, let's try this, let's try that. And I decided that I j just wasn't gonna be the one who was gonna limit her. She was gonna have enough limitations from society. I didn't need to be on top of it. So she also has the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, so with her extra movements, it causes problems with uh, dislocations. So it's kind of a comedy routine at our house, putting each other back in our, in our sockets. So Stephanie began early intervention at three months. I went, while she was still at the hospital, I uh, started the process. I looked up in her, my old ed special education notebooks and found the number and information for San Andreas Regional Center, called them up and got Stephanie in the system before she even became, came home from the hospital. So she started physical and occupational therapy at Children's, California Children's Services, CCS, at three months. And she also started early intervention in a very intensive program at Community Association for the Retarded, which is, uh, acronym is CAR. And then she started, where are you going? She started going to the early intervention program through the Santa Clara County Office of Education. At that time, uh, they started early intervention with the county at 18 months old. And so she started at Chandler Tripp School, a classroom for the orthopedically impaired. And she also was a part of Head Start. So Stephanie uses a communication device that she'll be speaking with. And she started Early intervention, she worked with technology, and she was born in 1990, so technology was new. So this was all in all the new laws, and everything was, was kind of churning right then. And so the, while she was at the early intervention at Carr, they suggested she go to Special Technology Center in Mountain View uh, because they didn't know what, what her capabilities were going to be, but maybe it would help her to be able to open her eyes and so we went to CAR for, I mean, I'm sorry, we went to Special Technology Center starting at six months until she was about seven years old. And they worked on her, uh, the computers to help her open her eyes to, for cause and effect. And then she started, they started teaching her how to communicate using a, a talker um, computer. And I believed in total communication. I, was um, trained in it when I was going to college for graduate school. So I helped Stephanie. Um, I didn't know if she'd be able to communicate. Nobody could give me answers. So they just didn't know. So when she was still in the hospital, when she was a baby, I started signing with her. Uh, and then anytime she showed eye pointing or facial gesture or anything that she, I could see that she was trying to communicate throughout the years, I just reinforced that real quick and give her what she wanted. And so then she received her first speech device at 18 months old when she started Chandler Trip School. And it was a basic one with yes, no, uh, green button for yes and red button for no. And then she went from that to a four button system that she was able to push and it had messages that were pre-recorded from school to home. And, um, and it was huge. <laughs> and it would go on to the tray and you can barely even see her. And so she had various speech devices after that, and it became clear that she was not gonna be able to verbally speak. And so she, uh, because she was nonverbal, and at that time they, they diagnosed her as mute, 
th then um, it was assumed that she didn't have intelligence and that she wasn't able to express her, her abilities. So that got to be a problem, and I, I would say that having her speech device and having limitations with her language was much more of a uh, drawback than having a wheelchair. And so uh, she had various speech devices, different companies, and then when she was in fourth grade, she was given her uh, speech device by Prinky Romich Company, and all of a sudden, everything just clicked for her. She had a teacher and a spe special education teacher and a speech therapist that all of a sudden uh, saw her capabilities and everything since then is history. It's, we'll t talk about that. And now she currently uses an Accent 1400 by PRC, Prinky Romich Company. So her inclusion in the community, um, I was a single mom. Her Father, um, when my girls, Stephanie was six and her sister was two, he abandoned the family. Um, he couldn't handle life in the fast lane. So st the girls went wherever I went. We traveled as a pack. And s I had Stephanie, she was very involved and still is with our church and religious education course classes. She was a Girl Scout. She performed uh, in San Jose Jones Musical Theater. And if you've never ever seen their productions, they're very, very professionally done. But they do have a policy that anybody who auditions gets a part in the play. And so when Stephanie started, she was she was uh, obsessed with Annie, and they were doing Annie. So I called them up, and they said, "Oh yeah, bring her in." And I said, uh, "Are you sure? You might want to meet her first. And so they said, "Oh no, no problem." So <laughs> I said, "Well, I think you might want to meet her first. So we brought her in, and. Uh, she ended up doing really well with the theater. They were great at in, in integrating her. And she was in, what about, she and her sister were probably in about 30 productions after that. She stuck with it until she aged out at 22. So she also did San Jose Parks and Recreation. And I'm a realist, so I understand that, you know, she's not going to go out and win an Olympic gold medal in hockey, you know, right off. So uh, she did figure skating and ice hockey from her wheelchair in an adaptive program. And I have pictures at the end of some of these programs she was in and of Annie when she was in the play. She also did adaptive bowling, was on a bowling team, and figured out the physics of how to spin the ball and get it to going to the right direction to be able to, to get a strike. So she did really well with that, um, with a ramp. And then she also attended the city's sports camp for adaptive sports. And she also started swimming when she was a baby um, at Timpany Center um, over by Valley Medical Center with San Jose State. Now it's run by San Jose State. And uh, she can swim about 20 laps across a pool with me holding on to her. So Stephanie's education, she attended the county programs for first at Chandler Trip, and then she went to Blackford Elementary School where she was in the class for orthopedically impaired. And she was mainstreamed into the general education classes, but that kind of meant that, uh, because this is how they did it, that she sat in the back of the classroom and just kind of breathed the same air as the other students. And I kept on saying, you know, but she needs to be learning with other kids. Well, you know, mom, she's not able to learn, so, you know, let's just, you know, one step at a time. And so for the first quite a few years, I ended up having to teach her from home because I knew that she had some abilities that weren't being tapped into. And then, like I said, in fourth and fifth grade, she ended up with an awesome teacher and speech therapist. She got the right device where she could finally communicate for the first time without going through me. Um, and they believed in Stephanie's potential. So then they said they helped her those two years. The mainstreaming increased. The expectations were very high. And so then when it was time for middle school, they said, you know, we think she's ready to be fully included into middle school. So we lived in another district, and I purposely moved, one of the reasons we moved to the district where Rogers Middle School was is because they, have the, they had the orthopedically impaired program, and if it didn't work for Stephanie to be fully included, we could slip her back into the program, and she wouldn't have to switch schools. So she went to Rogers Middle School and was fully included. She had no special education support or services. Uh, then she went to Prospect High School. 
and she was fully included at Prospect. And again, she had no accommodations, modifications. We were told that if she did, she wouldn't be able to earn her diploma, so, uh, which was very important to us. So she ended up uh, doing very well in high school, and despi despite some other issues we'll be talking about. So then from Prospect, she went to community college at West Valley, Indianza, and we had issues at times with them trying to fit her into a box that she wasn't quite fitting into um, and wanting her to take remedial classes when she really didn't need them and taking a basic computer class when it's like, well, she uses a computer to communicate. I think she can understand technology pretty well. So then she transferred from there to San Jose State. And at San Jose State, she majored in communication studies and minored in sociology. She graduated cum laude and with department honors. And she also was a member of Phi Kappa Phi. She was in Pulse Ministry Club. She, we would go to pretty much all of the Spartan football games and tailgate, we still do. Uh, and now she's receiving her master's degree at San Jose State in communication studies. And her, her uh, thesis is, uh, gosh, communication of the physically and I mean, actually you might want to ask her because it's too long for me to remember. <laughs> so she, there's a communications for the dis, dis slash abilities course at San Jose State and Stephanie took that and it's in the communication studies department and then they asked her to internship for them with that class for two years so she's done that and then she'll be doing that in the spring again but they just opened up a new course for the master's students and uh, She'll be helping with that class, too. And she also co-authored the textbook for the communications course. Um, and she'll be finishing her, her master's anywhere from December to February, depending on how things go. So she's all finished. She just has the rest of her thesis to finish up and uh, the board to go in front of and all that. So it takes a village. And the impact of others, I can't emphasize enough how much everybody has impacted that has con come in contact with Stephanie, has impacted her education and her mainstreaming and inclusion experiences. Teachers, all of her different therapists, I think at one point she was going to seven different types of therapy, all of her doctors and nurses that she's had over the years, families, friends, coworkers, and others in the community. And I like to say that there have been really positive experience and some experiences that were not as positive. Um, and I like to use the analogy that inclusion is kind of like going to the doctor, finding out that you need to eat more fruit, and they tell you, go to the farmer's market and buy some blueberries. And you're saying, well, I never really like blueberries, but okay, if that's what I need to do, I'll do it. So you could go to the farmer's market and the vendor that you wanted to go to doesn't have the blueberries, so you go to another one, and well, they're more expensive, they don't look as good, but okay, I'll go ahead and just buy them and I'll eat them anyway. So you could eat them and say, okay, well, that was better than I expected. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect. I ate blueberries as a kid, didn't like them, and okay, that worked. Or you could just put them aside and say, well, you know, that just isn't for me. And then a few days later, you go back and there's one blueberry, that isn't right and it's going rotten and then pretty soon the whole batch is bad. And then you say, well, you know, that was a bad batch of blueberries. I told you in the first place this wasn't gonna work. Well, inclusion I see in the same way. It can go really well and one positive attitude can really affect everybody and everything can work out well. And, or it can go the other way. It just takes one person and for them to have a not so nice attitude about inclusion and have the grumblies about it and it spreads. And an example is when she was in high school, she had a really, really rough time um, in high school. From the first day of school, the school nurse from the district said she doesn't belong here, we shouldn't have to include her and it spread from there. So we had teachers, aides, administrators all four years that just really weren't in, bought into Stephanie's inclusion. And there are classes for kids like her. Just put her in one of those classes. We were, um, for instance, she was told that she couldn't use the bathrooms at the school. 
I mean, things that were kind of ridiculous. We went, it's, I addressed that, and then it again happened later on and happened again. So I had to get a note from the gastroenterologist saying she should be allowed to use the bathroom at school. Uh, teachers refusing to have her in her, their classrooms. She had an aide who was supposed to be taking notes, sat in the back and just glared at her and gave her looks during the whole class to the point where a substitute teacher had to report her for not caring for Stephanie. And so things like that went on and on and on and just got worse and worse and worse. We had meeting after meeting. We had um, advocates. We had uh, lawyers involved. I turned them in for compliance issues with IEP. They were found in non-compliance with IEP a couple times. So, you know, I wasn't trying to be difficult. I just wanted Stephanie to get an education. So unfortunately, you know, the attitude is everything with inclusion. And whether it's out in the community or in the education system, it really matters what everybody's attitude is. Even if you haven't tried it before, um, you might be pleasantly surprised by the blueberries. And so she has worked very, very hard to get her education. She has done every bit of work that anybody's expected her to do, has never asked for extensions um, on assignments or use it as an excuse that she can't do it. That's not even a vocabulary word in our house. And she actually has worked, I'd say she's done five to 12 hours of homework every day her whole educational career. So now Stephanie's using her experiences, especially that those from high school, to impact others. And she's using them for her master's degree. And so her master's degree is research on the impact of support systems and attitudes towards people with disabilities and how it impacts them. Uh, and so she volunteers for the county, Santa Clara County Office of Education classes for the orthopedically impaired. One of the classes that she was actually in, she volunteers for, um, and she has a couple classes she goes to. And she helps the kids with their schoolwork, she helps them with their, with their devices. She's also an ambassador now for Pranky Romich Company that makes her device. And she does professional speeches all over the country. She's been doing a lot of Skypes um, recently throughout this, the country. Uh, and she leads social groups of children with communication devices to help them because if it's just like any other language, if you hear somebody else using it, then, then you are more comfortable with it. She is a mentor and she goes into schools and helps students who are fully included so it's a little bit easier experience for them and programs or devices to make sure they have the vocabulary to help them um, figure out the technology with it. And she is conducting research to empower those with significant physical and communicative differences and to impact their lives and to try to help them. And she loves meeting up with friends, loves Starbucks, and she's an active community me member, and everyone knows Stephanie. Her friend and she went for a walk the other day and on Saratoga Avenue, Busy Street. She, they said three different people stopped and stuck their head out the window, hey, Steph, you know, and kept on driving, and they aren't even sure who they were, but three different times. <laughs> so now I get to do the mommy thing. Her awards, um, in 19, 2016, she received the San Jose Role Model Hero Award from the city of San Jose. 2017, she received the Marie Carr Award in scholarship from San Jose State University for the Communication Studies Department, which came with a small scholarship uh, for her graduate school. And she also received the Volunteer of the Year Award for the Santa Clara County Office of Education. She was named a Changemaker of the Bay Area um, for the disabled community. And in November next month, we get to go to Orlando because ASHA, the Association for Speech Hearing, American Association for Speech Hearing, so whatever it is, uh, is, she'll be receiving an award for a distinguished lecture and award um, with them. So, oops, sorry. Now Stephanie's gonna do her presentation. We were hoping to have her device um, hooked up so that you'd be able to see what she's, how it works, but unfortunately that's not gonna work, so she's just gonna give you her speech and then later, um, if you, afterwards, we can hang around if you'd like to see how her device works. So here's Stephanie.
Hello, how many of you see me as any other 20-something years old? Well, I do. As you all know, I am earning my master's degree at San Jose State in Communication Studies, specializing in the cultural communication of people with significant physical and speech differing abilities, and their autonomy, independence, and sense of self. If I were to ask anyone that I know about myself, they'd probably say that I enjoy initiating and engaging in all types of conversations. Today I will be focusing on why I have cerebral palsy, ableism, my perspectives on integration, and my experiences of being in the educational system. First, I'd like to discuss the disorder I have to give you some type of medical background of myself. What I have is called severe athetoid cerebral palsy. It's defined as having mixed muscle tone, having the limited ability to sit in an upright position without proper support, having minimal balance, and having involuntary muscular movements. Since my cerebral palsy is severe, I have moderate to minimal gross, fine, facial, and oral motor abilities. Cerebral palsy, however, has possible issues that accompany with it, such as intellectual limitations, learning difficulties, vision and door hearing differences, verbal limitations, seizures, digestive issues, anxiety and door depression, lack of bladder and door bowel control, and sleeping challenges. Obviously, I do not have all of those issues, but I've experienced many of them. I'm not going to go into the issues that I have had, because I would like to focus on my abilities, rather than my limited abilities. I have many, many more abilities than disabilities, definitely. However, I want to explain my cerebral palsy, which was caused by oxygen deprivation, before, during, and after my birth. I had no heartbeat for 24 minutes, and they had trouble inserting the ventilator, since I had double collapsed lungs that were stuck together. After attempting 19 minutes, they were finally able to successfully insert the ventilator. Then they rushed me to Stanford, which is a hospital that has advanced medical technologies for the critically ill patients who require those advanced medical technologies. So, they have one of the most advanced neonatal intensive care units. Therefore, they sent me to Stanford, so that they could, possibly, save my life. They expected me to be in the hospital for six months. However, as we may know, I'm such a strong girl. I was there for nine days, where I experienced 13 hours of non-stop seizures, and was fent dependent for five days. On the sixth day, I miraculously was able to breathe independently, which was a remarkable blessing. Even though I had a rough start, I will not let it define me, as I do not identify myself as disabled, even though our culture assigned and imposed the identity of being disabled on me. I only identify myself as being Stephanie Fesso. I cannot be anyone else, except for being myself, as I am wonderfully made. The reason that I do not view myself as disabled is, I am more able than disabled, since the support from my family, wheelchair, AAC device, and people in my life have completely empowered my abilities, rather than disempowered them. I don't see myself as disabled in all realms of life, as I see myself as a typical millennial in my educational life, professional life, love life, personal life, and spiritual life. So, I hold myself to the same standards as my peers without significant mobility and communicative differences. I always have, and I always will. I never made an excuse for anything, since I have the same standards as everybody else. I have never wished that I did not have cerebral palsy, since it's one of the wonderful millions of pieces that make up who I am. I love, value, and accept who I am, as I am very thankful and humble for all the abilities that I actually do have. In spite that I have no issue with having this disability, we know that our culture is a different story. Our culture views those with differing abilities as special, atypical, not abled, special needs, and exceptional, which such labels reinforce, recreate, and reconstruct the exclusion of individuals with differing abilities from the hegemonic culture. Those with differing abilities have so many abilities, but they have to use accessible technologies and equipment for each individual's abilities in order to access and eventually empower those abilities that they actually do have. 
So, people with differing abilities are more than abled, but they need to have different, alternative ways of accessing those abilities. Therefore, those with differing abilities do not have special needs, nor are they any more special, exceptional, or atypical, than people without differing abilities, because no human is more special or typical than anyone else, especially in our culture that supports and encourages diversity. I even do not think that no one is average, whether they have differing abilities or not, as everyone is made differently from each other. So, it frustrates me whenever people think of me as just a wheelchair talker girl, rather than seeing me as a young lady who has many characteristics, who just so happens to use a supportive wheelchair full time and just needs to communicate differently from most people. Seems like people in society judge me for my disability, but I view my disability as a part of my life, among many other things. Speaking of our culture and society, I would love to discuss ableism and what ableism means in our everyday culture. As a part of my master's degree, I have been studying ableism. So, I want to pass my knowledge to you. Ableism can be described as the oppression against people with differing abilities. It can be discrimination, prejudice, and prejudgments toward people who have differing abilities because the social location of disabled individuals with differing abilities is not in the privileged group. Ableism is similar to other oppressions, such as racism, sexism, ageism, and homophobia, where ableism has differing avenues to be expressed. The avenues would be considered ideas, expectations, overgeneralizations, attitudes, practices, environmental barriers, inaccessibility, microaggressions, and door behavior. Ableism can be bold or subtle, and intentional or unintentional. Ableism can be bold, such as the AAC communicator's support systems take their AAC devices away for no apparent reason. Ableism can be expressed in a subtle way, such as families who have children with disabilities tend to see them as burdensome, or people without differing abilities think of a parking placard for a wheelchair accessible space as the lucky placard. What I noted is that, there is a binary of expectations toward people with disabilities. The culture sees those with differing abilities, as special and inspirational, or being less. This binary of expectations does not allow the culture to see people who have disabilities, as just people. The power of people without disabilities gives permission and the right to scribe, set, and reinforce the expectations toward people who have disabilities. Therefore, when people refer me as special or inspirational, those labels impose on me, which denies the fact that I'm like any human who makes mistakes now and then. I used to feel that I should be this wholesome person because of those labels, even though everyone knows that we all, whether we have differing abilities or not make every kinds of decisions, some good, some bad, and some straight up ugly, and I am no exception. So, I used to resist the labels, such as special and inspirational, by making not so wise, self-destructive decisions. My grades suffered because of those less than wise decisions. Although I used to want to fight against those labels in the past, now I view these types of encounters of people expecting me to be special or inspirational, as an opportunity for me to educate them that I'm just like anyone else who is 20-something years old. Sometimes I feel like I am a broken record, as I always tell people that I'm a typical millennial, except that I just have a wheelchair, have a speech device to communicate on, and need support with my personal care needs. Ableism has these avenues reinforce, recreate, and reconstruct the force from people without disabilities to exclude those who have disabilities from institutions, societal sectors, and society at large, just like what those labels have done for me. The other extreme expectations toward people who have disabilities generally are lowered, less important, and less valued than the overall societal expectations for those without disabilities, which derives from ableism. Ableism develops the societal structure for people without disabilities to become and maintain more privilege for those who have disabilities. Therefore, people without disabilities set lower expectations because they believe they are less. These expectations would be anywhere from people who have disabilities should be less educated, to less wise, to less experienced, to less knowledgeable, to less emotionally mature, 
to less valued, to less mentally independent, to less important than their non-disabled counterparts. So, the expectations communicate to people with differing abilities believe that they are uneducated, naive, inexperienced, not knowledgeable about life, emotional needy, less than valuable, incompetent to make decisions independently, and unimportant. Those with differing abilities become less since they believe the aspects of ableism are accurate. As you know, this phenomena is called internalized ableism, as internalized ableism is directly related to ableism which implies that people who have disabilities believe the products of ableism are true. It is likely these individuals who experience internalized ableism do not embrace their identity of having differing abilities, but they rather focus on what they are not able to do. A common phenomena of ableism, based on having expectations of being less, is an expectation that conveys those with significant differing abilities should be less mature. What happens usually is people with differing abilities internalize the statement of they are less mature, so adults with differing abilities don't respect themselves as adults, which not respecting themselves as adults reinforces the statement of they are less mature. These individuals, especially those with complex physical, communicative, and health differing needs, are dependent on their support systems. Rather than the support systems speak with people who have differing abilities, they speak for them, since there is an issue of dependency. However, it is quite frustrating, but it is an opportunity to have patience for people. Since I spoke about my cerebral palsy and ableism, I'll now discuss the relationship between ableism in the world and I'll offer an alternative frame of thinking to move forward in the world with less ableism. I've experienced unpleasant acts of ableism in the world, and some acts were straight up malicious. I'll only tell you some of the acts of ableism in the educational system, since we would be here until midnight otherwise. So, I hope by telling you about only several of my experiences with ableism in the educational system, it can encourage you all to rethink inclusion in the school system. The first thing that I would love to share about the educational system and ableism is assigning, imposing, and reinforcing the belief that individuals with differing abilities are less than valued to be educated with students without differing abilities. Before I was in fourth grade, I was not included nor integrated in general education classes. Instead, I was simply just mainstreamed when I was in kindergarten to third grade. Although these three words, integration, inclusion, and mainstream may sound the same, but I believe there is a difference in meanings behind these three words by using social science frameworks. The meanings behind these three words are socially constructed. Including children with disabilities implies that just adding children who have disabilities to do the same or similar work among their non-disabled peers. With inclusion, those without differing abilities do not adjust their communication or interaction to accommodate their cohorts who have disabilities, even though individuals who have differing abilities often adjust to their non-disabled peers' environment. It's just a one-way street. Whereas, mainstreaming implies that those who have disabilities act as if they are visitors to the environment to a setting of those without disabilities, and not necessarily have to do same or similar work as their non-disabled counterparts. Mainstreaming means students with differing abilities have a passive role in an environment, as they are seen as outsiders. Integrating, however, implies those without disabilities and students who have disabilities can accommodate to each other in order to have the most meaningful interactions for everyone involved. With integration, the both groups, those who have differing abilities and people without differing abilities, have an active role. Think about our relationships with people like friendships, romantic relationships, and even marriages, we have to accommodate to each other's individual needs to work together as a team. The goal is to build each other up through the interactions, no matter what abilities they have. With integration, there would be less division between students with differing abilities and students without differing abilities because everyone has active roles. I did not receive academic support after I graduated from elementary school. I was full-time included at Rogers Middle School and Prospect High School. With my educational experiences, the educational system did not integrate me wholeheartedly, even though I was included full-time, starting in sixth grade. 
the only school that integrated me genuinely has been San Jose State, so every school aside from San Jose State just included me rather than integrated me. Whenever I experience integration, it places a significant amount of value on me as a student because everyone sees me just like my peers without differing abilities. If there is integration, it would help with shifting our thinking of those who have differing abilities from the quote, token disabled person mentality, to the thinking of people who have differing abilities contributes the overall diversity. So, every time I was mainstreamed before fourth grade, I felt like I was nothing but a visitor. My general and special education teachers set up such limited expectations for me so they did not teach me much. The limited expectations derived from the notion that I am less valued than my peers without differing abilities. Since ableism created and recreated the frame of thinking that people with disabilities are less valued in the institutions, such as the educational system, it is so critical to address the root of the issue. We need to expose and start realizing there are power structures between people with differing abilities and those without differing abilities. In order to begin valuing those who have differing abilities, just like we do value individuals without these disabilities, it is all about being mindful of placing value on everyone, no matter of people's abilities. Every time we value individuals who have differing abilities, it reinforces how people value themselves as unique individuals. Another way to limit the ableism in the world, such as in the educational system, is to see students with differing abilities as how old they really are. Unfortunately, more often than not, our schools treat students with differing abilities as less than mature. From my personal experiences, when I was in second grade, they highly suggested that I need to repeat second grade all over again, because students with cerebral palsy need to have intensive cognitive support. But they did not teach me anything that year, so I was behind with my academics. When my mom mentioned they did not teach me grade level curriculum, they told her repeating grades was some type of unofficial procedure for students with severe differing abilities, like students with my type of cerebral palsy. Thankfully, my mom resisted the idea of me repeating grades, since I did not have to have cognitive support, even though the school system before I was in fourth grade assumed that I had significant intellectual challenges. Oftentimes, what I've noted that students who graduated from a school, but students stay at that same school. Even though students are significantly older than everybody, repeating grades and staying at their previous schools even though they graduated one, two, or even three years ago reinforce the expectation that those with differing abilities are less mature. When a student with differing abilities who is 13 years old and is in elementary school still, it creates and recreates the message that the students with differing abilities are less mature than their peers without differing abilities. Adolescents are so different from the students from elementary schools, especially with their differing social and emotional needs. So, adolescents who have differing abilities at elementary schools do not have their peers who are the same ages to interact with, which produces and reproduces their social and emotional difficulties. Another common trend among people with differing abilities, in relation with the framework of immaturity, is that they do not respect themselves as how old they really are, such as many adults with cerebral palsy text me to say hi, and I don't answer quickly because I have countless priorities, then they write me a couple of hours later to say hi again. Of course, it reinforces that dependency issue that we discussed about earlier, as the support systems make those who have differing abilities depend on the support systems on everything, even though they are more than able to do some of the things without any support. I cannot help but to think what if institutions, such as the educational systems, integrated them. What if schools integrate everyone, no matter of their abilities, with each other's age? Would people with differing abilities have less social and emotional difficulties if the educational systems would stop delaying the students' development? We can support our students by encouraging the educational system to respect students with differing abilities as their age, so they can internalize the expectation for them to be mature. Advocating for students who have differing abilities to be with their peers who are the same ages can produce and reproduce having healthy social and emotional development. The second to the last way that I would like to share about ableism in the world, such as the education system, 
that we need to be mindful of is the assumption that people who have differing abilities are less competent. There are so many times that the education system deemed me as less competent. Sure, I had many supportive teachers who believed in me. But I never had the whole educational system cohesively expect competency from me until I started earning my bachelor's at San Jose State, where I was really challenged for the first time in my education journey. My professors have integrated me by treating me as an actual student, rather than a token disabled one. This is important since it is outdated and unacceptable to have a token student or even an employee who is from a minority group, like having a token black or gay student or worker. At San Jose State, I am sure that they do not label me as a token disabled student. They have the same exact expectations of me as they do with the rest of their students. By integrating me, it makes me feel important as a part in the educational system for the very first time. Of course, San Jose State is not perfect, as nothing is perfect in the world. Although I feel really thankful that San Jose State believed that I am competent, in all the years that I was mainstreamed and included, I felt that I was a non-disabled student's territory as an outsider because of I have differing abilities. The message of being not competent enough in the educational system produced and reproduced so much insecurities within me. In my mind, I thought I'm as competent as my cohorts without differing abilities, but a part of my mind believed that I was not competent enough. But often the message that I was not competent enough spoke louder than the truth. My high school experiences were just awful and emotionally taxing. At that school, my one-on-one -on -one health aides and teachers reinforced the message that I was not competent enough by believing that I cheated on my work since I have a speech device and need complete direct support with my personal care due to my severe cerebral palsy. They were making me do my school work again, threatening to fail me and talking about how I am not competent enough in front of me. I psychologically blocked out many of the details, which I had been feeling thankful for. But I am using my difficult, traumatic experiences for my thesis, and we found the, all the IP paperwork, emails, and homework journals, which brought the memories from my high school experiences right back. I've been healing from that. I was believing lies from my high school experiences. One of the lies that I used to believe in is people with disabilities are less than competent, and such lies sometimes produces and reinforces the internalized ableism, which contributes these individuals' mental health issues. Since it contributes to these individuals' mental health issues, they have to face ableism that relates with non-visible differing abilities, in addition to ableism that associates with visible differing abilities. They have to face the double ableism. So... I believed that the lie about believing I was not competent enough, which influenced my mental health, and I had to face with ableism that related with my mental health. So, what I find helps me is asking myself whether the message is a lie or truth, and whenever it is a lie, I decide to reject that lie and replace that lie with the truth. My favorite truth that I love to tell myself is I can do anything that I want to do, but there is a different way for me to do it. Because of that, I am able to live every day fully. Also, another end of ableism continuum is expecting those with differing abilities to be special. What I find is the support systems impose the label of special onto people who have differing abilities. So, those with differing abilities are above the expectations of everyone else. An example of this expectation is, often students with physical differing abilities go on social media with their phones even though it is a no-phone zone. The instructors and professors do not say something to the students, which reinforces the division between students with differing abilities and those without. Another example of this expectation is, students with differing abilities sometimes decide not to use accessible services, such as transportation that drive people who have differing abilities. The transportation for those with differing abilities is not the best, but I've used this service for nine years. And I feel so thankful for this service since it really, really empowered my independence, rather than disempowered them. With my friends, nurses, and even my sister and aunt, we've gone anywhere and everywhere within Santa Clara County, and it is free for San Jose State students who have significant physical and or vision differing abilities. 
Even I made friends with some of the drivers. I feel that people who do not decide using this service have to rely on others, which really disempowers their independence. I am really grateful that I'm humble enough to use the services, so I am able to live my life fully. So, today we spoke about why I have cerebral palsy, ableism, and how integration works. I know, without ableism, I would be a weaker person. I'd be at a different place in my life, certainly. I'd like to wish good luck to all of you by being mindful of ableism. Thank you so much for listening to me. Now I'm opening up to you all to ask me questions. What questions do you have? So we'll have questions, and this is where we would usually put Stephanie's screen up so you can see how her language works, but unfortunately we can't get it hooked up. But if, again, if you'd like to see it afterwards, then you can. Questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah. How long did it take you to write that speech? It was wonderful. Awesome. Question. It. Probably. took me 30 o'clock hour hours awesome question it probably took me 30 hours Uh, so I'm interested in learning a little bit more about the social groups that you facilitate. Could you describe those a little bit and how that works? Awesome. Question. Two. Awesome question two. I L E A D lead small groups of those with communication devices both s t r u Structure, structured, or U, N, S, T, unstructured. I lead small groups of those with communication devices, both structured or unstructured. I. F R E G regular regularly L E lead small groups In.
Watsonville. How old? Which is every six month months where? I E N C O U Encourage The Students to communicate on communication devices. doing any some kind of a c t active activities I regularly lead small groups in Watsonville, which is every six months, where I encourage the students to communicate on communication devices while doing some kind of activities. I use to go to camp for people. With S I significant differing abilities and I L E A D lead small groups for camper campers with communication devices which was you n s t unstructured it was like a Small group 
Conversation. Conversations. I used to go to camp for people with significant differing abilities, and I lead small groups for campers with communication devices, which was unstructured. It was like a small group conversation. If the teachers in your elementary had treated you differently, as in um, having higher expectations for you, how do you think things would have been different for you? That is a thought-provoking question makes me think that is a thought-provoking question makes me think if Teacher, teachers were would had higher. Expectation, expectations for me. H O N S T. Honest, honestly. I think I did. Save a lot of what time? Time. At home. Because my Mom taught me at home. If teachers would had higher expectations for me, Honestly, I think it'd save a lot of time at home because my mom taught me at home. Probably. We'd have more. Time to have
fun. Then, probably we'd have more time to have fun then. Then. I could. Have. Learn. More. And. More. Faster. And. Faster. Since. School. Would. Had. Actually. Teach. Me. Then I could have learned more and more, faster and faster, since school would had actually teach me. Also. Also, my thirteenth, fourth, and Fifth. G. R. A. D. Grade. Teacher. Worked. Harder. To catch me. Up. With. A. V. X. C. A. Academic. Academics. Also, my fourth and fifth grade teacher worked harder to catch me up with academics. So. A as A teacher teachers daughter I would A D. 
V. Advise. The teacher teachers to teach everyone no M A T Matter. What kind of abilities that students have? So, your C O L L W O co workers don't have to work harder to catch. Students up with a academic academics. So, as a teacher's daughter, I would advise the teachers to teach everyone, no matter what kind of abilities that students have, so your co workers don't have to work harder to catch students up with academics. I think in your um, um, in your presentation, I saw that she attended Janet classes in high school. As a former high school special ed SAI teacher, I know how hard it is to keep students on all the assignments in Janet classes. I'm just curious how she even kept up because it's the load is quite a bit. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, we worked very hard. I mean, it was, it was important to her. That was the first thing. And she really wanted that. And we always gave her, I always gave her the option of, you know, if this is too much, we can always go back into special education class or a resource. And she always wanted to go through high school and get her to receive her diploma. And so it, it took five to 12 hours of homework every night, Saturday, Sundays, holidays. Uh, and so she did every single assignment, like I said, you know, that the other students had done, and it was not easy. Uh, and it was a long road, but it prepared her for college. So it, it worked out in the end. Well, thank you. <laughs> it was a lot of work, and it still is, but it's much easier than high school. I, no, I just want to say I'm sure it's some kind, it's a huge collaborative effort. Um, Thank you. And your mom must have helped you all along the way. But as a teacher with a student who is in San Jose State right now, and I will talk to you privately, who is a young girl who was a lot like you, and I had the honor of teaching her for seven years, I have been on the other side of the journey. Yeah. I hope you know each other. I will talk to you privately about she that one in does. a second. She knows everybody. <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about, too. Yeah? Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> okay.
thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I realize we only have a few more minutes. What accommodations or how did they make the curriculum accessible to her? I'm just like, did she have, it sounded like maybe there was a note taker, but even now in college, like, do they record things for you so that she can listen? Does she, how, do you mind if I does she, that how is she able to participate in like a little bit more specifics, I guess? Okay. Do you want to take that one or do you want me to? You want me to? Okay. So uh, it changed throughout the years. Um, when she was in high school, we had a really hard time getting the school to do any type of accommodation. She had a one-on-one -on -one health aid. We got them to agree on a health aid um, after she had some issues and, and ripped open her stomach. Um, they decided that maybe she need, does need somebody with her. Uh, and so she did have a one-on-one -on -one health aid slash academic aid. Um, they were supposed to have taken notes. That got to be a huge deal because they, it wasn't in their job description to write to take notes. We've had teachers, whatever works out for the teacher, the school, the situation. Uh, I was her reader. They refused to give us any books on tape. Um, a couple teachers did give us the books on tape, which was on the IEP. Um, but I did do all of her reading. Um, now that she's at San Jose State, she goes, she had extended time on assignments um, throughout school, uh, such as testing. She had to turn her assignments in with everybody else, but testing, um, that created some problems with logistics of how to do that. Um, but now that she's at San Jose State, she has a nurse that went with her until I had to resign, and now I go with her, and I always went to evening classes because realistically she had to have some of the classes in the evening. So we take the notes for her. Um, some of the professors will email Stephanie the class um, presentations or PowerPoints, and that will be her class notes. Um, we have books that she listens to audito auditory uh, with her computer system. Um, I do a lot of the reading and highlighting, so if there's a, a lot of highlighting, it's just faster for me to help her by reading and highlighting, and she points when she wants something highlighted, and I just highlight it on the computer or on paper. Um, and so she still continues to spend about five to 12 hours on homework every day. She sends a lot of assignments pr directly to the professor. So if she's taking a test or an assignment, she has internet with her, her device, so she's able to get it to the professor right away. We've had problems using some of the resources at the college level because by the time they get the books, the textbooks, and get them available for her, the class has already been in session for two weeks and she's already behind. So this is just a way that we have found that's easiest and best for us to be able to keep up with the work because once she's behind, that's it. You know, just like any student, but it's really hard to get caught up again. So uh, she really hasn't even used the services at San Jose State. Um, I don't even think ever has used really the services. They know of her very well. Um, they understand the situation and we don't have to use the testing center. She is able to now do all the testing um, either at home or because most of her classes are essay writing and they don't have a lot of actual testing. But when she did have testing for a bachelor's degree, she would do a lot of it and send the teacher the, the answers or uh, able to do it in the classroom. And actually, I was shocked the first time I took a test and was not helping her but over to the side that she wasn't the last one to finish in the classroom, and I was like, wow, <laughs> that's a, a big improvement. So she's able to do it within the time limit that they even give her um, for testing. But she does need somebody to help her support with, with her academics. Any other questions? Does that answer your question? OK. Okay, well, thank you. We will stay if you have any other questions or want to see her device. 